Okay, so good evening everyone. Um, my name is Ron Munitz. I'm the founder of the PSG and Nubo. And um, I'd like to welcome you to an introduction to ROM cooking for the x86 uh, architecture. It's kind of a primer course, so it's a one-on-one -on -one course, and uh, it's going to have two sections. One of them is going to be more introductory. The second one is going to be more hands-on, and as I explained to you previously, then uh, at the end of this class, you'll be able to uh, actually take the source code, which I'm showing here, and uh, just <coughs> fork it and repeat the exact same steps listed in this presentation and build your own ROM for QEMU. So basically what we're going to talk about is obviously I'm going to talk about a little bit about your background and about my background and Android, which I suppose most of you know. Then I'm going to take a little dive into embedded build systems. And this is obviously the Embedded Linux Conference and Android Builder Summit, so I suppose most of you are familiar with the concepts there. And then I'm going to talk about the various x86 projects. There are a couple of them, um, one of them is dominated by Intel, the other one is a, an open source project I'm a member of, it's called androidx86.org, and of course there is the vanilla Android itself, and there are some other forks, but these are the major forks that there are, and then we're going to take a little break and have the second uh, section. So before we start, I just want to know a couple of things about you guys, so who's using Android as a device? Okay, that makes about half. And who's using a custom ROM on their Android device? That makes it a little less than a half, good. Um, those who raised their hand, did you build your own ROM, maybe? Okay, I see a uh, nodding, okay, that would be one. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, ROM uh, concept and uh, just one last question. Who's done embedded Linux development? Okay, that's almost everyone, so I'll, I'll stick more into the Android part and skip the embedded stuff. Okay, so a little bit about myself. So I'm a Linux guy. I've been doing Linux for the last decade and beyond that. And uh, I've dealt a lot with uh, avionic systems, and not only Linux, also hard real-time systems. Then I did some video routers, and in the last couple of years, <coughs> over five years, I've done a lot of consulting and helping people usually startups to do board bring-ups. So um, my last company, the company I founded, Nubo, it does actually a remote display protocol for Android. It's targeted toward the enterprise. It helps to solve the enterprise mobility problems. And um, I also run the PSCG, which is a premium software consultancy group um, in which we help people to do board design, board bring-ups, and uh, we do also some training. I also teach uh, at the New Circle. We do um, a lot of cool stuff, a lot of Android development, Linux development, and Android internal courses. And I'm a senior lecturer at the FECA College of Engineering in Tel Aviv. So I do a lot of stuff. I try to do it well, but I most of all, I consider myself as a Linux guy and as a teacher. Um, I do a lot of teaching. It's a privilege. I hope you learn a lot here. So Android, most of you know what it is. It is an operating system, so I'll just sum up like 12 years of history, and I'll try to make them in, li in under the ne than one minute. <coughs> Sorry, so but the story of Android starts in 2002, where Paige and Brin uh, attend a session right over the block, and they see, um, <coughs> they see the CEO of Danger back then, Andy Rubin, presenting the first internet phone, which is called Sidekick, they love it, they start using it, and the phone doesn't really meet a commercial success. A couple of years later, these guys acquire a, a company called Android, which nobody knew anything about it at the time. And nine years later, there doesn't exist a single uni human being in this planet who doesn't know what Android is. So basically in 2007, Google started their first uh, developer challenge. It was a total price of $10 million. And then Android uh, started getting popularity. 2008, there was the first Android phone out on the market. And in 2010, it was the first time that the Android market share actually exceeded the one of Apple. In 2011, uh, there was the most terrible operating system ever, which was called Honeycomb. It wasn't even open sourced, only partially, something like a year or two after that. But on the very same year, there was the bigger and better brother of uh, this honeycomb, which was Ice Cream Sandwich, 
where Google first made uh, a, a unified operating system for both tablets and um, <coughs> cellular phones. And then in the subsequent years, in 2012, Google improved the UI significantly with Project Butter and Jelly Bean. 2013, KitKat, the first commercial brand, uh, came out to the market. And right now in 2014 and in the future, you can see an ever increasing number of devices, of manufacturers. The devices are powerful and <laughs> there are a lot of apps and there are a lot of uh, modders, a lot of platform builders. If any one of you was in the <coughs> Mobile World Congress a couple of months ago, then you'd see like any, any quantity of uh, phone manufacturers, wearable manufacturers, those, a lot of companies you never even heard of, everybody have their phones and they have like a flat of phones. So it's something really amazing. So there is a lot of business in there and it's pretty much, it pretty much became like the new embedded Linux, but for phones. As you all know, there are also a lot of uh, buzz around wearable devices. So Android also runs on Google Glass, for example. There, there is currently something like the Google Glass Mirror API, which is on the Android Wear uh, platform. But obviously it will be a fully fledged Android to some extent and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of things you can do with Android and this is just a little bit about history. So when I'm talking about Android and ROM, um, <coughs> ROM development uh, in general, then basically we're talking about an operating system, a mobile operating system. It has a couple of parts. One of them is what the end user knows best, which are applications. Applications that each and every one of you can submit to the Play Store, which was formerly known as the market, and uh, some applications that may be bundled in your device, maybe by your phone provider, maybe by Google themselves. So basically, this application needs some framework to run them. So this is the Android operating system, which is obviously unchangeable for most of the users, but you as device manufacturers or ROM cookers, you can change that. So basically when talking about Android ROM, we're talking about the operating system, which is a fully flat Java operating system that runs all these cool uh, graphics and window management and notifications and so on. Obviously this Java system cannot run uh, on bare hardware. So there is like an intermediate layer which runs some C libraries and C++ library and target specific assembly code. And there are also a couple of runtimes of uh, Java virtual machines called the Art and the Dalvik, which are also obviously implemented in assembly and C and C++ and they ac actually execute the Java code. So all this wonder runs on top of a Linux kernel which actually communicates with the hardware and so on. So when I'm talking about modifying a ROM or about what ROM is in general, I'm talking actually about taking all this diagram, which is antique. It no longer shows in source.android.com, but it, it was there for like for five years, I think. Taking all this diagram and making wonders there, creating magic there. So I'm gonna have to talk a little bit about uh, what ROM is and ROM cooking. Um, so basically, ROM, the definition of it is read-only memory. Everybody knows this. Um, it, another definition may be a software image of read-only memory as of a game cartridge used in emulation. For example, those of you who played Super Nintendo back then in the 90s or Sega Mega Drive, these cassettes with the Super Mario with Sonic, these were called ROM. Everybody knew that like Super Mario, it's a ROM. So there are also other definitions. <coughs> like Wikipedia educators in computer and mathematics, which I assume are us, then read-only memory is a type of storage media that is used in computers and other electronic devices. ROM image, a computer file, which contains a copy of the data from a read-only memory chip. And there are some other definitions like range of motion, which may be relevant for robots based on Android, but it's not really relevant for ROM cooking, okay? So just to see we are on the same line, like Cyanogen mode educators, you can flash a ROM onto the ROM, which isn't really a ROM. That means you can flash that software image onto a read-only memory, but it's not a read-only memory because otherwise you wouldn't be able to flash into it in the first place. So just, uh, most of you know, uh, most of you are even experts of embedded systems, so I'm just going to talk about the Android part of it. So basically when I'm talking about embedded software, then I would have a couple of components which are the build system, the tools for the build system, the operating system that runs the build system. And I would have the target that I would want to work with. For example, the host may be this laptop. I can type a couple of commands, build a Tizen or Linux or Android or whatever, and then flash it into this phone. 
So this phone would be the target device, and this would be the host device. So the basics uh, of build systems are answering the question of how do I pass my stuff from the host and onto the target. So basically, in Android, you have two ways of doing this. One way, as every application developer knows, is using the Android debug bridge, the ADB. The second one is actually a tool for taking all the low-level stuff, like all the diagram I showed you before, taking all this, and on a lower level, on a bootloader level, just flash it, copy its contents into the device memory. So in order to do that, there is another tool which is called Fastboot, and both of them are a part of the Android build system, the Android tools. So basically, when you want to build your first ROM, you do everything you do on a, any other embedded system. You have a build system, and you have the, an operating system, you have the tool chains, you have cross tool chains, because usually your target device is not the same as your host device. And then you may have uh, source control tools or whatever, because this is software development. Even though we are sort of creating programs for hardware, it's still software development, so we'd have to use source control. So we do something which is called the build process, like taking all those source files and binary blobs and firmware maybe, and packing them into images. And these images eventually will be laid on our hardware. So since this is a build system, I can choose with a single host, I can choose multiple configurations, multiple recipes, and just build for target number one or for target number two. I'll have images which are the build artifacts, and that's it. So in Android, um, the tools I have, the OS tool chains, the prerequisites are as follows. I need to have a Linux-based uh, system. I can also use Mac, but there are usually problems with the uh, newer versions, and it takes time to keep up. So my recommendation is to use Linux, 64-bit Linux variant, with a lot of cores and a lot, a lot, a lot of memory. It's very important. If you have an SSD card, it's even better. So the other requirements are GNU tool chain. You have to use GNU make. You must have Python, you must use Bash as your shell, you must use Oracle JDK, that is very important. Um, you can use OpenJDK and it, it even works, but no one guarantees it will work and it will work only if you hack the build system because there is like a check that, hey, am I using Oracle JDK? If not, boom, then break the build. And you also have Git, this is the source control system, and you have Repo, which is a very powerful Git wrapper. Android is a huge system and huge system has a lot of components and they are being, <coughs> delivered by different companies, and in order to keep all the components aligned to the same baseline, you need some way of managing them. This way is repo. So if you want to download the source code, you actually use the repo source tools. So this is the host tools. And in order to create these target artifacts, what I'm going to do, what you're going to do when you're going to do with a build system, is to run a launch command, which actually selects your run configuration, I'll get to it later, and apply make, just a GNU make. I can do it for a first target, I can do it for a second target, I will have under my directory, the directory out slash target slash product slash target name, I'll have a couple of, of image files, which I'll elaborate later, and then I can take those image files, like system image, data, recovery, boot, and so on, and apply a fast boot flash command in order to take all my build artifacts, all those binaries, and flash them into the hardware. Once I've done that, then I will have uh, my new shiny Android ROM on my target. So this is the simplified way of doing it. And basically, um, <coughs> I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you right now the first example of flashing a ROM, not on a real uh, target, but on the most popular Android target, which is the Android emulator, just to get a sense of uh, what we just seen here. So uh, I have the Pedium now, but I'll, I'll use it a little bit later. So basically, if I go to, to the Android, uh, I hope you can see that. I'll make it a little bit bigger. So basically, my Android uh, source directory, once I download it with this repo tool, I'll talk about it later, it looks like this. It has several folders. I'm going to elaborate on the device, on the device folder and on the vendor folder, which is not here, and I'm going to find all my target artifacts in out. All this magic happens because of a lot of scripts, shell scripts and Python scripts, which are under the build folder. And in order to build my ROM, I'm going to do the following steps. 
I'm going to source a file called build setup.sh. I hope you see me well. And then I'm going to launch a configuration. For example, for the emulator, it's going to be AOSXP x86. I can choose a variant, engineering, user, um, or <coughs> user debug. Engineering provides me root accessibility and a lot of debugging tools. User debug will provide me with a um, root option with an optional root and with uh, a lot of debugging tools, but a little less. And user build will not provide me with root. So when I create a device as an OEM, I'll do a user build. So I will do a launch, then I'll do make, and I won't do it now because it will take time. And then at the end of the time, I can run an Android emulator. So if I want to, after I did make, if it was a real device, I would do something like fast boot flash or fast boot flash all. And then uh, all, all the contents of uh, my new built ROM will be flashed into this device. In the emulator, since it's an emulator, it doesn't really have hardware. But when I boot it, it will know to take the images, and I'll explain about it a little bit later. And then it takes these images, runs them within the QEMU wrapper Android delivered, and then you'll have a fully fledged Android system. So I have the boot animation, and uh, in a couple of seconds, I also have. Um, <coughs> the system itself. So this is a ROM that I built myself, obviously. And uh, we can see that it's an Android, and we can see that it's a KitKat. So let's just be sure about it. Android version, so KitKat, and everybody's happy. So this is the first example of using the build system. So yeah? This is a build for x86. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about, I'm I have a couple of uh, slides about how to speed up your application developer, but um, I'm not going to talk about it too much. So I'm just going to give the answer. The answer is if you want to speed up Android development, use x86 emulator. I'm talking about application development. Use x86 emulator and use KVM uh, in Linux or use a HXM, which is Intel Hardware Acceleration Module, in Linux or in, in a Windows or Mac. So now talking about Android, now I'm going to put it back together with the embedded stuff. So basically, when I'm talking about ROM, I have a couple of components. So the traditional, the traditional uh, terminology of ROM is whatever lies on the internal memory of your device. So basically, I have a couple of very important components, which are as follows. The first one is the recovery mode. If things go very bad, then I want to have some way to recover from them. So for this purpose, Android has delivered us with a, a mechanism of booting into a Linux operating system, which does recovery. That's what it does. So there, is, there will be a partition on your device flash, which will have a recovery image which is merely a kernel and an initial RAM disk. There is also another partition, which is for the operational mode. This partition will have, obviously, a boot image and a kernel and initial RAM disk. By the way, the bootloader, uh, whatever bootloader that might be, which will support fast boot if it's, if it's an official, if it's a certified Android uh, product, the bootloader will obviously load the kernel, and the kernel uh, <coughs> will load uh, the inter and will load the interd with it. But what you have in, the, in this, in the operational mode, is a boot image that once the kernel finished booting, it loads, it actually mounts a system partition where you have all this Java stuff I showed you before, all the operating system. So here we actually have usually a couple of partitions. One of them will be the boot partition. Uh, it will usually be packed within a boot.img file on your host. And the second one will be a system image, which will always be system.img on your host. So this system image, if you want, for example, to modify an, an APK or push an APK to be a part of your ROM, then you need to make it find its way onto the, onto the system partition. There is something that everybody, if you, all of you, must know, which is over gear update. You know it as users, probably. Uh, like Apple or Microsoft or Google or Samsung or HTC or whatever OEM that may be, may tell you from time to time, hey, you have a system update available. Do you want to do that? And you, of course you don't want to do that because it's a waste of time. But then you say, OK, I'm sick of it. I'm tired of it. I want to get real notifications. So I'll do the system update. And you do the system update. The device reboots. And then automatically, you have a new software. So 
How does this happen? The, the way the, this happens is that when your device reboots, it has some sort of state keeping. So this state keeping actually is being done on a non-volatile partition, which is the MISC partition. And once you reboot, then there is like a transition from the operational mode to recovery mode and vice versa. And this is all being kept within a non-volatile partition, which is the MISC. What is not a part of the ROM? Everything that you can write for to. So for example, the data partition, wherever you save your application data or wherever you save, it, you save the application you download for the Play Store or the cache, the Dalby cache or whatever you write to, to external cache directory as an application developer or so on, this is not a part of the ROM. The external SD card is also not a part of the ROM, although in KitKat a lot of people uh, may argue with that if you are active at uh, the Android Builders or Android Platform Google Group then you'd know that everybody complain about the new SD card mechanism because they can't write to regions they used to be able to write to and that breaks a lot of applications which is actually great because it's a, this is the way it should be. I mean, no one should have uh, unprivileged uh, <coughs> access to, to the SD card. So the SD card, the data and the cache are not a part of the ROM. So when I talk about the Android ROM storage layout, <coughs> then I have the following components. First of all, it's important to know that Android, in its essence, is Linux. So I can examine its contents with Linux tools. So if I do a DF to check out my partition, I will see a dev, which is the dev file system, obviously. I'll see a couple of Mount Secure, Ace, and OBB, which I'll get to in a second. I'll see system, cache, and data directories, which are the ROM directory for the system. Cache and data, which are writable. And I see Mount Shell emulated, which is an FU's um, um, <coughs> file system for the SD card. I can also examine the Android ROM storage layout via the mount command. So if I do mount, this slide actually shows poor Linux um, mount points. I have a rootFS, I have tempfs, I have devpts, I have a proc file system, sysfs, and debugfs. Obviously, you have that in any Linux distribution unless you don't want to enable debugfs, for example. On the other hand, you also have a couple of other components, which are mount secure and ASAC and OBB, which have to do with secure Android containers and with OBB is uh, some sort of application packed binary blobs. Uh, it extends APKs and so on. You have C group uh, a mounted at ACCT and C group mounted at slash dev CPU control, which are Android way of doing scheduling. Android has to do scheduling in order to ensure that uh, the application that its UI is in the front gets the most attention. So it uses obviously Linux scheduling with some other um, trickery stuff. And then you have a couple of cryptic stuff that we as embedded Linux developers love. So you have dev block platform, blah, 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 blah. In this case, it's a Tigra. It's a Tigra 3 on a, on a grouper and a Nexus, uh, Nexus 7 device. And then you'll see that it's by name, app is mounted as a system and it's ext4. You also see that for cache, you also see that for data. And you also see over there an F use a mount point which is Mount Shell emulator, which is the SD card. So this is just to show like the DF and the mount uh, output of um, any Android machine. So now when uh, you want to build your own device, then comes the question of, uh, okay, so I know I need to have these uh, partitions. Android uses them. Every Android device uses them. Why? Because I told you so. No, why? Because that's the way Android is planned. So basically when you do a, a board bring up, you need to actually know where to put it without, within the partition. So in this example, for example, um, NVIDIA provided a Tigra 3 a <coughs> a <coughs> system on chip, and it has an NMC block, which is divided into nine partitions, NMC block um, 0P1 until NMC block 0P9. Obviously, it doesn't say anything to anyone. So if I have something like that and I need to do some recovery or some system update, or need to plan or even need to copy the design from some other uh, manufacturer. Okay, do I want to do reverse engineer, learn what they do and do the same. Then how would I be able to match this to, uh, to the partition Android needs like system and so on. So basically in this case, uh, Nvidia was kind enough to provide symbolic link under the SDHCI Tigra 3 by name. And it tells me that app points to MC block 0P3. Um, that needs, which is the boot, points to partition two, and so on and so forth. Another way I'd be able to do that is to look at the block size. For example, this is 665,600 665, blocks. 
and I can see when I do a DF that the system is 639 megabytes. So it kind of makes sense. They kind of line up and I can say, okay, so this might be the system A block. So what I can do with this actually is just take a partition, if I have enabled to it, and disk dump the contents of some image file right onto it, and then I replace my ROM immediately. I don't need to know anything about software. I just need to know how to access this partition, be able to flash to it, and that's it. So I can just replace block by block. And this is effectively um, a ROM uh, overriding. So basically, this usually bores a lot of people, especially when it's an Android uh, developer conference, uh, and not an embedded Linux conference as this one. But uh, I always talk about it because it's a must. These are the basic blocks of everything. So why should we care about it? So f for a couple of reasons, actually. One of them would be backup. If I want to backup my stuff, just, I can just disk dump the partition into a file, and then I have a backup forever. If I want to do recovery, same thing. If I want to plan software updates, if I'm an engineer, want to design a software update mechanism, there is no way around it. I must know how to deal with the, how the partition layout is, and so on. If I want to handle with trusted boot, which right now not too many companies deal with, but uh, I'm pretty sure that every company will deal with that, and that will be a problem uh, for raw mothers. So, but if I want to work with a uh, trusted boot and I want to verify my uh, boot chain, then I would have to know the partition uh, layout. If I want to do error checking, and obviously if I want to do board design, which I do a lot and I uh, consult a lot about it, it's super important. And the most important reason would be curiosity, which is the most important reason for everything. So that's about the Android uh, and its partition layout. And basically, now we can actually talk about the software itself, uh, which will be a little uh, lighter. So the Android open source project is a semi-open source project in terms that it is uh, maintained by Google. And uh, you as engineers don't really have any, any point in decision making. And uh, you just get what Google provides you when they decide to, to get a new flagship uh, product to market. And then you have access to all code. You can suggest some bug fixes uh, via Garrett, and then uh, that's it, more or less. Um, so you get access to the code, but you don't get access to all of it. Um, the nice thing about getting access to the code is especially if you are an OEM that uh, partner with Google, you can get the access ahead of time. In order, for example, LG, when they're working on the Nexus 5 or Nexus 4, then they were working with Google, so they had all the access ahead of time. And this Android build system, even if you don't work with Google, it provides you all the templates to build your own um, hardware. You can, you can derive templates for building a BSP. You can derive templates for uh, hooking up your blob, your firmware, and so on and so forth. If you are a curious engineer who just want to use this AOSP, this open source project, for Google devices, for the Nexus devices, then for the couple of last Nexus devices, beginning with Nexus 4, I think, then Google provides you the entire uh, build system with all the binaries within the source code. So it's pretty convenient. And that would be the first point I go to after I learned how to build for an emulator. I take a Google device, like a Nexus 4 or Nexus 5 or Nexus 10, I go to the AOSP, build the matching configuration, flash it, burn a couple of times, and then uh, after I've broken a device or two, then I'd say, okay, I cooked my own ROM. So basically, if I, you just want to go and do what I just said, you're going to do the following. You're going to go to source.android.com and do whatever they say that, as simple as that. I'll say a little bit of what they say that, which is setting up a 64 Linux development machine. And if you, I don't see a reason why you want to build anything under J, Jellybean 4.2.1, but you might. So uh, unless you don't want to do that, then you use Ubuntu 12.04 or higher. This is the officially supported the version, but other Ubuntu work and uh, CentOS works. And you know, it's just if something doesn't work, then uh, Google. Somebody else probably was frustrated enough to try and solve uh, build system problems for you. So once you've done that, you create a directory, you apply a repo init, which initializes the branch for um, all the Git code that will be downloaded, and then you hit repo sync, which takes a lot of Git uh, projects and just clones them. Then you source build and set up .sh, launch and make, which is what I did uh, before with the emulator. And at the end of it, you can flash it or just run emulator and so on. So basically, if you have a Google device, um, what you'd want to do is to Go to the device while it's up, 
do ADB reboot bootloader, it will load the bootloader, it will run to the bootloader and not to the fully fledged graphical system. And then you'd want to, at the first time you would do that, you'd want to do fastboot OEM unlock. Before that, you'd want to back up all your data because the moment you unlock your device, then it wipes all the data. This is some sort of a protection. And don't forget it. <laughs> I did. The first couple of times I, did, I uh, consistently forgot it and I was sorry because I had pictures on the phone. But uh, it happens. So basically, you do that, it will give you this, uh, OK, so do you, are you sure you want to do that? Are you really sure you want to do that? And of course, you're sure you want to do that because we all have press yes. We're very positive, and that's all. So once you've done that, you can flash your own ROMs. And when you do that, you should be aware that a lot of times, most of your hardware components will not work. This is because um, everything in the system uh, requires binary blobs, for example, from, for your GPU, for a graphic, graphics uh, processor, for your Wi-Fi, for your Bluetooth, for your GPS, for your CDMA, GSM, whatever that is. So you need to obtain the binary blobs first. In order to know what binary blobs you need, there will be a file under a device vendor name product, uh, which is called binary blobs. Um, so actually, it might be under device and it might be under vendor. And this file is a textual file that will say, hey, this is what you have on the device, and uh, that's it. So this is a pretty long topic, and I will be happy to cover it a little bit more later. But uh, there is something which is extremely important for me, which is all the kernel stuff. So most of the people who customize ROM don't ever need to deal with the kernel. But if you're going to build your own x86 build uh, your, your own x86 device, you're going to have to modify the kernel. Because when you build your own device, you have your own hardware, and there is absolutely no way of going around it without modifying the kernel. So basically, um, Android also did a pretty good job in helping you engineers. And it pretty much um, it pretty much added uh, kernel templates, and it uh, cooperates with a lot of vendors. And you can just go to <coughs> android.googlesource.com/kernel/target-name and clone this target. So common target names are the common target, which is the reference uh, board. 100% that if you use common on a device, it will not work. But all devices make modifications to this tree. You have MSM, which is for Qualcomm, OMAP, which is for TI, which have been out of the market for a year or so. They stopped manufacturing uh, mobile chips. And you have Tigra, which is NVIDIA, Axinos, which is Samsung. And then you have Goldfish, which is a designated kernel designated for the Android emulator. So basically, uh, I'm going to talk about it uh, in a couple of slides, because it's a very important concept about the Android uh, engineering uh, concepts. So I'm going to talk about very old stuff from a couple of years ago, and then I'm going to talk about the, the picture, the up-to-date picture. So basically, up until last year, until 4.2, the Goldfish kernel, which uses the Android emulator, was 2.6.29. The 2.6.29 kernel, I think it was out like five years ago, maybe even more. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. And it's antique, OK? But the nice thing about it is that even if you use it now, that Goldfish kernel that every Android distribution, from Eclair, um, even from Donut, until KitKat, would work perfectly with it. It would work perfectly. Maybe, I'm not sure whether it has support for SE Linux, which is important for KitKat. So that may be a reason not to use a uh, Goldfish anymore, uh, 2.6.29 anymore. But basically, it will work with any distribution. And that's a very nice thing about Android. The system and the kernel are reasonably decoupled. And the nice thing about an emulator, in contrary to a device, is that it's just an emulator anyway. And you know, if it does what it has to do, and it's, if it ain't broken, then don't fix it. It's a waste of time. And those of you who may have tried to hack um, the vanilla kernel, and so, hey, there is a goldfish content, so that uh, the vanilla kernel has a very broken goldfish content. So uh, somebody just delivered it without ever checking. And it's complicated. I've done a couple of uh, hacks to that uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, if you really need some sort of a uh, goldfish kernel, which is for a more up-to-date kernel, just contact me. Uh, I'd be happy to help you. So basically, um, the, the nice thing about Android kernels 
is that ever since the vanilla kernel 3.4, most of the Android stuff is within the kernel, in the staging area. Um, just a little bit of history, and Android and the kernel guys didn't really agree about almost anything. So the Android kernel and the vanilla kernel were completely different stuff. So every time you wanted like, to upgrade your, um, your own uh, device to use a particular Android uh, kernel version or a particular vanilla uh, kernel version, then you'd have to do patches from here to there. It's a lot of time. It's a headache. You get glasses. Your eyes are ruined. It's a nightmare. It's a lot of work with patch, and nobody likes that. Uh, the nice thing about the 3.4 kernel and the current kernels is that you can just enable staging area, and then you'll probably be all set with, um, <coughs> without even patching anything. This can be very, very, very convenient. And in the case of x86 product, you'd usually not even need um, any Android-based kernel. You have the Intel, uh, the Android IA kernels, and you have the Android x86.org kernel. I'm going to talk about this project later, but that pretty much gets you done. If you want to build an Android um, emulator kernel, a Goldfish kernel, then I recommend to have a look at the external QMU distrib build kernel.sh script at the Android open source project, because there are a lot of um, GCC wrappers that has to be set, and this pretty much solves them all. So, Basically, when talking about vanilla kernels, and I'm going to talk about it in the context of running Android on QEMU, then this is a very serious topic because when you need to work with uh, specific devices, you really need to know what you do. And one of the things that breaks most of Android distributions, at least um, on, the initial br uh, on the initial bring up phase, is the graphic acceleration. Graphic acceleration is a very hard topic, and uh, when we did we, did a, we dealt a lot with it in the Android x86.org project, even on very standard Intel i915 chipset. It's always a nightmare, but once, uh, it, it's very hard to get it um, done. And usually with virtual machines like QEMU, VirtualBox, uh, VMware, and the likes, there is no good um, graphic acceleration support. So it's not even worth the, the headache and the pain of getting into it. So when I'm going to talk to you about these kernels, I'm just going to use the VESA drivers and uh, not do anything related to DRM, DRI, graphic acceleration. So basically, if you want, yeah. Quick question. You're referring to the graphic acceleration within the, uh, on the virtual machine, not the uh, graphic acceleration on the target hardware, right? Uh, I'm talking about both. This is always a headache, because when you have a target hardware, then you need actually to be able to build the firmware and the matching components on the Android uh, parts. And uh, the firmware usually would be the problem. And you need to debug it. If you are the hardware uh, vendor, then it's much easier for you. If you are some guy trying to modify Android and you have no, you don't really know like what was changed from other versions, then you need to work with, some, it's a headache, it's a nightmare. But on the virtual machines itself, usually virtual machines, they lack support for graphic acceleration. And even if they do have support, then it's very problematic. So this is a very, this is a painful uh, topic. And uh, actually, the Mesa guys did a, did fantastic work on it. But um, so there is some sort of support for VMware and for VirtualBox too. But it's always a mess. I mean, if it's just a virtual machine anyway, I'd recommend not to really just to bypass all the hardware acceleration stuff unless you really, really, really need it. And uh, most chances is that you don't because uh, if you, when you build a device, then you want to check the hardware on the hardware itself, not on a virtual machine. So basically, if you want to make a kernel for such a virtual machine based on QEMU, I'm not going to get too much into it because it's a lot of material and I want to also show you stuff. <laughs> so basically what you need to do is first of all, enable config staging area. Without staging area, you have nothing of Android, absolutely nothing. Then you'd need to also select like your target architecture. Um, if you want to use an x86 UMU, which as I said is much faster because if you run an x86 host, then you won't have to emulate ARM, which takes a lot of cycles and it's very slow. Then you select your architecture. You pretty much search for everything in Android, which says Android in the kernel config. And very important, you enable VirtIO drivers because QEMU would usually use VirtIO. So you need to enable the, the PCI, you need to enable VirtIO block, and you need to enable a couple of other uh, 
blocks. Obviously, you have like options in QEMU itself. It can use some virtio options. It can decide not to use some virtio option. But this is the general guideline. This is a rule of thumb. Very important is to enable frame buffer configurations and VESA configurations in order to tell Android, hey, you work with frame buffer, you don't work with DRM, we don't, you don't uh, work with a hardware acceleration, with a direct rendering model. And a very important tip is that at first part, you tell the kernel command line, QEMU equals one. Android itself has a hack for the Android emulator, among uh, other stuff, that says, hey, I'm running in QEMU mode, so just know that. When it knows that, it can render OpenGL operator, uh, operations with uh, the software OpenGL render and so on. So basically, um, there are a couple of other things that you need to know about modifying kernel, and I'm going to go very fast about it. Um, you, have, you also have like the design decision for the storage. You can decide what file system you want to use. So up in the older Goldfish kernel, 2.6.29, then uh, Android used some sort of YAFs, yet another flash file system too. So it was based on, it, was, uh, it worked with MTD, and when you try to zoom out, you'd see that you have an MTD block, dev block, MTD block, blah, 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 and then you have a system data and cache partition. On the newer Goldfish kernel, it's actually ext4, sorry. It's actually ext4, and then, um, for a reason I don't really understand because it makes no sense, it still uses MTD. Probably remainder from the other kernel. So the point about it is that you can really choose what file system layout you want to work with, like what file system itself you want to work with. If I wanted to do it with a custom vanilla kernel, then I probably, as I, as I done, then I probably just say, okay, I don't really need to use MTD. I want to attach, if I have QEMU and I want to attach an, an external hard disk, then I want to attach this hard disk as a block device, and that's what I'm going to do in the next session. So when I actually look at it, and here I have a lot of other stuff, and uh, like uh, all the CSFS groups, the C groups, the uh, SE Linux that I like using, and so on and so forth, when I want to attach it, I just attach a dev block SDA system, and I mount it as an EXT4 partition, and that's it. That's a regular kernel. And uh, I re don't really need MTD for that. So basically, uh, I already showed you how uh, the build process was uh, for KitKat with the build and setup, launch, and uh, launching the emulator. So this has been the build process for all emulators, actually, um, ever since the beginning of time, more or less, uh, even for Jelly Bean, and it's always the same. You can uh, see for yourself. So when using the emulator, I, I already said this tip, but uh, it's very important to use um, <coughs> CPU hardware acceleration. I mean, uh, if you can use hardware components, do that. In Linux, it's by using the KVM. In other platforms, it's by using Intel uh, hardware acceleration module. Another important tip is to enable keyboard. If you just launch and make, then on the default OSP config, you will not have hardware keyboard. So you'll have to go and just click on the soft keyboard and you won't be able to work with that. I mean, you will, but it's, it's, uh, it's tedious. So you can actually do that by editing the external QEMU Android AVD hardware properties in a file, and then rebuild only external QEMU. Building Android takes a lot of time. Building the Android emulator itself, the QEMU wrapper, is immediate. You, you, get, you, you finish it with less than a minute. There are other x86 configurations straight off the AOSP. For example, for a um, virtual box, which is always broken, actually. It's a miracle to have it working out of the ASP. And you can uh, actually build an SDK for other platforms, like building an SDK for Windows. You can do it by launching SDK and make Win SDK. And then you'll have a zip file with the SDK that you can give to your Windows developer, for example, if you want to make customization. The use case is as follows. If you want to create some hardware, and you also want to create software for this hardware, like applications, like APK, then in this case, um, probably you'd have a couple of teams, and every team would use whatever works best for them, like Mac or Windows or Linux or whatever. So in order, if you make customizations, then you'd want to just give them the SDK itself. And so you make an SDK for Windows, and everybody can work with their own emulator, which are customized. So this is uh, very convenient. Um, basically, what we're going to do in the next session, uh, we're going to adjust a little bit uh, the OSP for KVM. 
Um, and the motivation for it is if you want to make your own hardware, then uh, first you want to bring up the operating system itself, the parts that are not, that do not concern the hardware itself, you want to bring it on a virtual machine. You want to verify um, basic functionality, then your hardware team will presumably work on uh, the hardware itself. And then when uh, it's time for integration, you d one doesn't have to wait for the other, you just integrate, you don't uh, reinvent everything. So basically, in order to do that, you just use the emulator images, just as I showed before, and you mount an ext4, you take care of SD cards, which is very important in KitKat, because without SD card, for example, the camera will not work, uh, and the browser will not work either. So you do that, and um, that's it pretty much. So a, um, a couple of things about Android projects, so there is the OSP, I talked about it right now, and there are a couple of other projects, build systems. One of them is the Android x86.org uh, project. You can check it out at android.x86. And another one is Android IA. There are other, many other forks like Silent Gen Mode, which I mentioned, like Android VM, BuildBraid, and many others which are too numerous to name. Uh, a special slide always goes to Silent Gen Mode because they are amazing. This is, a, this is pretty much the most popular uh, aftermarket um, ROM distribution. They do, they actually provide ROM for dozens of uh, devices and they deserve all the credit. So if you want to build a ROM for your own device, if it's not a Nexus, a Google device, then I strongly recommend to go to Soundagen mode and check what they offer, unless it's an x86 device, which is a different story. So now I'm going to, t we're going to have to take a break in a couple of minutes, but I think if you're okay with it, I think I'm gonna skip the break. Okay, or just make it shorter. So a couple of things about x86 projects. So the interesting fact is that the first x86 project was not even by the Android open source project itself, but it was by Android x86.org project. It um, debuted in 2009, and um, only in 2011 did the Google and the OSP put an emulator for x86. In 2012, Intel came up with their Android IA product. <coughs> and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the advantages and disadvantages of all of them. So basically, the AOSP itself is the common reference for all of them. It provides the Android emulator based on QEMU, which I just mentioned. It works on any hosted OS. It supports multiple architectures, um, but it's very slow on the ARM or MIPS ones. Uh, it performs terribly if you run under a virtual machine because nested virtualization is a, a very hard topic. Um, it has no installer, so you can't use it as a standalone. And uh, the kernel is relatively old most of the time. So, but it's okay because it's an emulator for better and worse. Android x86 is a pure open source project. It was developed by open source community. It's very friendly for Linux developers. It's easier to debug stuff, to debug the init process and so on and so forth. It supports many Intel and AMD devices. It's very friendly to virtual machines, and it's uh, mature, recognized, and stable. But since it's an open source project, which is being done uh, voluntarily, then it needs developers. So if any of you want to help, either as a tester or as a developer, you can contact me, you can contact the community. This would be great. We do very nice work, and a lot of people love it. So just join on board. Um, Android IA. So this is a very interesting project. Uh, it's very interesting because it's pretty much got out of control in, in uh, terms of schedules, uh, in terms that it got out in 2012, and when it got out, it was, uh, it was just the start. So it, was, it could be better. It got excellent in a couple of months. And then uh, last year, then Intel just stopped working on it. It stopped updating it in, around the Jelly Bean 4.2. And then um, actually work on it resu resumed only on KitKat, which was last month. So the nice thing about it is that it works amazingly on uh, Intel devices, on, uh, on the newest Intel processors. It uh, uses relatively new kernel versions when Intel actually work on it. It has an integrated um, Ethernet patch, um, which is something I appreciate very much because I worked on it uh, on the Android x86 project. But um, obviously it only works for Intel devices because Intel do it. 
And uh, there is also a very big problem. If you want to install it alongside with other operating system, like the multi-boot it, then it just doesn't work. I mean, if you just try to install it, it will wipe all your data off. So this is something that uh, you need to know what to do uh, when dealing with that. You need to take the risk. Uh, community work is OK, and it could be better, but it's still governed by Intel. Uh, so you can't like take decisions for everyone. And Intel forms are not really based on it, but I heard there is a merge, but I'm not working for Intel, so I can't say. Basically, <coughs> um, you know what? Let's take a let's take a five minutes break, okay? For those who returned from the break, um, I finished the, the previous section with uh, talking about the Android, the AOSP, Android X86, and Android IA, and now I'm going to actually to compare them and. Uh, in the next 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to devise a strategy of how to combine them and how to multi-boot them. So the Lion Foundation is the Android is Linux. Um, so the required minimum to run Android would be having a Linux kernel, a file system, and RAM disk, initRD, whatever makes you happy with init main.c. When you have like a, um, <coughs> a run init script or run init executable and so on and so forth. So up until the init executable or script, we have a Linux kernel, nothing fancy, nothing special. Maybe only the Android drivers, but that's the kernel customization. Um, Android IA, on the other part, um, well, the start is also Linux, but it has some uh, Android-ish features. So when you talk about Android IA, about the Intel part, then the same rules also apply to any standard Android. And the reason I'm pointing it out is because Android x86, which I said is very Linux uh, developer friendly, is completely different. So Android and and Android x86 would have a couple of partitions, uh, in addition to the system partition that I mentioned earlier. So it will have a boot partition, will have the kernel and the RAM disk. It will have a partition for your cover image. It will have the Smith as discussed. It will have system, which is the flash system image. It will have cache partition, data partition, Installation definition partition, which is not part of all Android, but it is a part of the Intel one. It will have a bootloader partition, which uh, actually <coughs> is uh, something that will take care either of legacy boot in very old Intel uh, Android IA product, or of GAMI boot or the UEFI boot in uh, the recent ones. And it has a partition that includes the droid boot.image uh, file, which implements the fast boot protocol. So basically, if you want to use Android IA at this time, you must have a UEFI um, supporting board, which means that you cannot use Intel, unless you do some tricks, which I'm going to mention uh, in a couple of slides, with old machines. Uh, this is a shame, because a very good use of Android is just making use of very old machines, which is um, something that a lot of people started messing, up with, messing around with Linux, they started by saying, hey, I have this uh, old computer. I can do nothing with it. Will I throw it? OK, let's try to break it. Let's install Linux. And that's how people become hackers. So you can do the same with Android, and, uh, but you can do it with Android IA. With Android x86, actually, the structure is as follows. We have one partition with two directories. One of the directories may or not may be the bootloader. So you can install uh, an Android x86 with the live CD and have a uh, grub, the legacy grub actually, uh, bootloader on it. A second directory will contain the Android uh, system itself. What will it contain? It will contain a kernel, an initial RAM disk, and another RAM disk. I will explain the details of that and the purpose later. It will also include the system partition or a system directory actually. You can, have, you can either have a system uh, SquashFS or, or image or whatever, or ext4 image, ext3 image, or so on and a data folder or squash FS or an uh, image. So this structure makes it actually very easy to work and debug because you can just take any of these components, copy another component to it on file system, reboot, and as long as grab or your other bootloader points to it, you can just work with that. So when Android IA and when Android um, actually boot, they do the following sequence. Once the bootloader started, the combined kernel and RAM disk, which is uh, on the boot image or the boot partition in Android IA. Then at the end of the kernel initialization, the init script runs from the RAM disk. 
Then file system are mounted in the Android way. Um, the Android way says that running init script, it has to read some uh, init RC uh, files. It's a little different than system v init, um, but it's also, it has a syntax, it has a language. And once it does that, what it, once it reads, uh, <coughs> once it reads this init RC, it parses it, then it knows how to mount the system partition and what services to run, and then it runs the Surface Flinger and other graphics uh, services and so on and so forth, and that is how Android comes up. Okay, people are returning from the break, that's good. And on the other end, Android X86 is doing something which I am a huge fan of. Um, it's called Change Root. That's the whole concept of Android X86, and that that's why, in my opinion, it's so developer-friendly or genius even. So what Android X86 does is it follows. It starts the bootloader, and then it starts a, a minimal busybox Linux distribution. Okay, that's what it has on, the, on its init RD. So the, the busybox distribution, it has an init script, which is textual. I can show it to you later. And this script loads a couple of modules, and at the end of it, it does a change route to the init script, which is part of Android. So this part of Intel and Android that runs the init script from a RAM disk happens only after the change root, okay? So this is a, a bit redundant, but uh, it makes it very easy to debug the Android init script. So which one is better? Actually, it really depends. So if you need more de better developer options, then I think Android x86 is a, a bit easier to deal with. If you need debugging the init process, then in my opinion, the Android x86 is easier. If you need support for hardware and secure boot methods, then I would go for the Android IA, if it's Intel hardware and so on. If you need support for over-the-air update, then I would definitely go with Android IA. Android x86 does not support over-the-air updates. You can work on it and then it will support it. And it's a, if you're talking about licensing, well, I'm not a lawyer and uh, it's too long then just accept and so on. Now, I really don't know like what are the policies within Intel. I'm pretty sure it's like Android and then like, um, if you need specific, uh, if you have specific issues, then just, you know, read them through, consult the lawyer and so on. If you need to participate in project direction, then, you know, you can try with Intel, but uh, Android x86 would go like smoother. And if you need upstream features, well, it depends on the rate. And up until three months ago, then I'd say, uh, Intel uh, no longer work on the Android IA product, but uh, now they got an uh, amazing KitKat uh, version, so I'd say, okay, maybe Intel. It depends, you know, whoever goes first. So there is no black and white, and it really depends what you need, and you know, if you're just an explorer and just getting like into the wrong cooking stuff, um, then you can just try both. The nice thing is that you can actually um, leverage the Android x86 change root mechanism in order to use both, in order to use an, uh, any distribution you want. And you're going to do this as follows. You're going to use the Android x86 and storage system with the initial RAM disk and the change root. Then you're going to put your desired Android files, that is the kernel, RAM disk, and system, and it's very important for them to be matching because if you have some firmware that requires a specific kernel version, then the firmware will probably be somewhere within your system image under like a, under system lib, uh, or system lib uh, firmware, blah, 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 blah. Or vendor in some distributions, under slash vendor lib. Uh, it can be in several places. But the important thing is that the system has to be compatible with your kernel. So you put all your system kernel RAM disk um, in the same place. And then once Android x86 in it runs, you change root into that uh, place where you put the kernel and the matching uh, RAM disk and system. So it does redundant stuff. But it's some sort of a hack, so it doesn't really matter. I mean, if you have specific problems, you need specific solutions. That's the way engineering works. So this way, you can actually multiple boot various projects. We can multiple boot Android IA and AOSP and maybe any other operating system to work along with that. You can also use any Linux distribution and apply change rules over there. And it's a little bit more complicated, and I'm not going to get into it right now. So basically, if you want to look uh, how to do it with Grub, I want to go to, to the source tree. So I'll just uh, do it. Um, I'll just give a, a live example. So in another computer I had, then I had the following partition layout. SDA5 had a, a Linux 
file system, it has a Linux system, it had Ubuntu, for example, UDEF, TMPFS, and so on are lock, share memory, irrelevant Linux stuff. And then I had mounted on, my, on, my, uh, on this Linux machine, I created, a, I compiled the Android x86 and the Intel and even NeoSP images like system image, boot image, and so on and so forth. And I put them under media Android x86, which lie under dev SDA1, okay? So my Linux was in SDA5 and my Android whatever was in SDA1. So what I would do there in Grub2 actually was a couple of things in order to multi-boot. So here in this example, it was a Jelly Bean x86. So I have, um, I, I, I installed the module for uh, MS-DOS and ext 2 and so on and so forth. I set root to MS-DOS1, which is HDA1. And then I load the kernel, Linux, uh, JBX86 kernel. I tell it Android boot.hardware equals Android x86. This is very important because the init script, init.rc, um, the first thing it does, it calls init dot, your hardware name dot rc in order to load uh, some proprietary properties. So this kernel parameter, Android boot.hardware, you'll need in any Android uh, customization you do. Uh, the video modes, and SRC said JBX86, and then the Android X86 um, init script, it knows how to look in the SRC folder and get whatever it needs. It also says to the kernel that the initRD would be initRD.image, which will contain the textual um, initRC script. Another thing I can do is to load Android IA with it. So when I would load it, it would say loading Android IA. It's also on MS-DOS 1, and the kernel is Linux, AIA kernel, and here Android boot hardware is IVB, which is Ivory Bridge, for instance. initRD would be AIA, initRD.IMG, and so on and so forth. So I can actually multiple boot all of them by supplying the same initial RAM disk, which is Android x86 based, with any kernel I choose. The kernel has to match, um, <coughs> the, kernel has to match the system and the, the initRD, which, which kind of comprises of the hardware and the firmware and all that. And uh, in addition to that, I put uh, the system image that eventually will also, I will, a, a RAM disk that will eventually contain the init script that relates to the Android distribution I really want to use, whether it is Android x86 or AOSP or uh, Android IA, and the matching system image, which is my ROM. So, so far, we, uh, we looked at uh, various ways of building ROMs uh, with AOSP devices. We looked at how to build an AOSP emulator. We talked about Android x86, Android IA, and we saw how to multi-boot all of them. As I said uh, to some guys in the break, in order to really deep dive into them, we need, we need a day, okay? We need like four hours easily. But uh, now in the next model, I want actually to take a quick look at the Android build system and then see how we can uh, create and modify the AOSP in order to create our own ROM for QEMU. Um, are there any questions so about what we learned so far. Okay, so basically um, what we have in the Android build system itself, we have a couple of things. We have host tools, target tools, platform tools, some documentation tools. Obviously we have uh, the Android platform code base, like all the system services and uh, under framework base and the native services and applications like calendar and launcher, home, home two, home three, and so on and so forth. And we have the build system, which is under the build uh, folder. So this is a very a huge topic, but uh, as I said before, build system does take a series of rules or recipes, and they know how to generate an embedded platform images or artifacts, including uh, the blobs and so on. And the thing about a build system is that if you give them the name of the configuration you require, then they will generate the required output, which you will be able later to flash to your uh, device or run if it's an emulator. So the Android build system essentially consists of a two or two and a half folders. That would be build, which contains the definitions of the build system along with some predefined devices. And device, which contains definition for devices. The build system really parses them. There is another optional folder, uh, which is mostly used for vendor specific uh, blobs and the likes, which is called vendor. And if you, uh, if you, for example, download CyanogenMode or download a source tree 
or some binaries for SOSCRI 40A or SP for some devices, then you'll see that you'll have a new folder under the root of your Android build system called Vendor. In, in there, you'll have all the firmware and uh, other hardware-specific stuff. So Vendor is another folder. It's not a, a must-have, but it is uh, useful. So basically, um, what we have here, I'm, I'm going to skip about uh, most of it. Uh, most of the build system is under uh, build core MK. Um, this is the only file that's been included for the main make file. And essentially, all this build and setup, launch config and make, they, make a, they parse a couple of um, scripts and run a couple of Python scripts as well in order to do a very, very, very sophisticated uh, build system and rules. So when you try to actually approach a device, you mostly care about two things. You'll care about um, launching the, the, file the, uh, the environment variables, which is the nfsetup.sh, because it has also a lot of uh, nice shortcuts for you to work in with the source files, like go dear, cgrep, jgrep, and so on. And you'll care about the target file uh, folder. So the target folder actually contains two folders. One of them is for board definition files. It's called board. And the other one is for product definition files. It's called product. So basically, all the build recipes you'll need if you want to customize a device are in either of these two directories. And the way it works is basically that um, there is an Android MK file for every module you may need. Build system knows how to parse it. And that's uh, how it's been incorporated into the build. There is a syntax. There is a language that you use. And every, ma every such make file will use this syntax. I will not go into this uh, syntax too much within this uh, lecture. But I will do a follow-up um, in a couple of weeks, and you will be able to see it online, probably. But the important thing is that each, when you try to um, make your, a new device, then the build system dictates that uh, your new device folder, which will be under device, manufacturer name, device name, it will have to contain the following files, boardconfig.mk and device.mk. Boardconfig will have some board definitions, and device MK will have some board and hardware related stuff. So basically, um, when you actually want to tell what um, hardware you have, like if you want to, have, to use a kernel, you want to use a pre-built kernel, you want to use some sort of architecture like x86 or ARC, you need to edit some stuff in the board config. There is also another folder which is called the product, which uh, is more uh, about the packages that you would need within your final product. And the way it works is basically if you want to define a product like the AOSP x86 emulator, then you'll have a make file which will include other make files, which will include other make files, and so on and so forth. I have it in a more graphical way, which makes it a little bit uh, easier to follow. So basically, if I take a look in the, in the Android source tree under product AOSP arm.mk or ASP x86.mk, then I'd see that it includes a product full.mk file. And it also says in this file that product name is AOSP ARM. This way, uh, the build system knows that when I do launch, an AOSP ARM correlates to this um, device. Now, productful.mk, it includes AOSP base telephony.mk, product slash AOSP base telephony.mk. It's got a little cut here. And it, this files in terms, includes the full base telephony.mk, which takes care of a, a, an operating system that allows to deal with the telephony, like with the GPRS, with the, and, and so on. Uh, SMS, media, as we we'll, as we'll say, we'll see in the next uh, folder. And full product actually includes here board emulator.mk, which includes product packages, includes the Android emulator, libgles translator, which is for translating OpenGL um, calls. And it does a couple of uh, copying from the host into the target with a product copy file directive. So everything you see here in caps lock is actually keyword that specify uh, properties within the Android build system. So you can override any of this, and then you modify the behavior of the system, actually. So what we have here, we have, includes, we have included product full.mk that in turn included base telephony, AOSP based telephony, generic device MK and board emulator MK, which are terminals. Then product full-based telephony will have a couple of product packages, 
uh, it will have product property overrides. For example, the build, uh, there can be some stuff under the build, uh, <coughs> the build prop file. If you know under the, ta the target, you have build prop or system prop files that these are override. And then when you do like get prop, then you'll have like a pretty fine properties. You can do product copy files, which copy files from the board, from the source to the target. And it also includes other um, packages or other make files. For example, it includes product telephony MK, which in terms has the, the following product packages, the dialer for the phone, MMS for the media, and RealD, which is the radio interface layer daemon. Because if you want to communicate with the, the radio chipset, then you have to have some uh, way of real. This also includes full base, which includes locales full, generic no telephony, and so on and so forth. So we have like an inclusion, like as if you have uh, import in Java or include chain in C, then you also have includes in make files. So basically, um, this is how it goes, and I want to go out to show you how our device looks like. So this was the emulator, and it is no longer needed, actually. OK. So can you see it in the back? All right. Make it a little larger, just in case. So basically, all right. So basically, what we have here, we have um, a device directory. If you want to manufacture your own device, you'll have to line up with other uh, very respectful companies like Samsung, Sample, no, not really LG, um, Asus, and so forth. So here, I, I created a new device under a company called ELC Embedded Linux Conference. Embedded Linux conference has a, a readme file, which is uh, on my GitHub. It's for another conference I've spoken, but it's the same uh, principles. I will upload these files as well later on. Um, and here I have a couple of components. I have a product called AOSP KVM. I have embedded KVM, and I have kernel configs. So basically, AOSP KVM includes the following files. It includes an Android MK, Android products MK, and a couple of other files, and I'm going to walk you through each and every one of them. And you can fork them later from GitHub. Just add this directory structure, ELC, AOSP, KVM, and you'll be able to reproduce exactly what we see here. So as I said, every component in the Android build system must have an Android MK file. So this Android MK file has a local path called my dear, which just saves a variable. It says, hey, this is my uh, PWD, this is my work directory. And it says, include, call all make files under local path. So every time it see a make file, a .mk file, it will incorporate it to the build system. All right? Good. So this was the first file, the first file. The second file, endreadproducts.mk. Android products.mk, it says the following. It says product make files. The important thing is not the file names themselves. The important thing is to have the, the directives like product make files or product copy files and all this kind of stuff. This, this is the stuff the build system understands, okay? But it makes it much easier to use the uh, names that the build system expects or is uh, used to, like Android products and stuff. Android MK is a definite must. So I look, product make files, it says local dir, which is my directory, slash elc 2014 aospkvm.mk. So I promise to look at this file later. I will actually look at the end. I want to proceed. I have boardconfig.mk. This is the file that actually defines my uh, board. And uh, just a reminder, what I'm building here, as I said before, will be a full-fledged Android to run on QEMU without the Android emulator, OK? So you can take these images, just modify the hardware, the kernel, and if you're lucky enough, you'll be able to run it on your own hardware. And if you're not, you have to work hard, and you will not be lucky. You will have to work hard. But that's the way in life. Practice makes perfect. So this file has some directives, like a target has no bootloader, no kernel. Target CPU ABI equals x86. If you don't do that, then uh, the build system will assume you're using some variant of ARM. So um, here we also have uh, target user images, UZXT4, um, which means UZXT4 do not use the apps. 
All Android distribution currently use EXT4. I mean, YAFS is uh, very old. Sparse EXT disabled. Board system image partition size. This is very important. In this one is a couple of, uh, there's a lot of zeros here. And uh, I think it's 500 mega, more or less. And if my build system, if I pack like a lot of APKs or do some stuff, exceeds this number, then, I will, then the build will fail. And I will not be able to flash to a partition uh, whatever I'm building. And this is important because when I'm building a ROM, I need to reserve enough space for that. And if I want to reserve, maybe I have some constraints. Maybe the hardware manufacturer said, hey, you have only 300 megabytes available for a system image. So I need to se first set the system image partition size to match that. And in that case, if I fail, building, then I can even, uh, I, I can be happy because this way actually I failed in building and not in production. So that's uh, pretty nice. In the same uh, fashion, there is a user data image partition size, which is for the data partition. There is the block size of the flash. And there are some other properties that I'm not going to go into um, too much, but target shell, you can have ash or make a shell. And you can decide whether to do a, a, the JIT the DEX pre-optimizations if you want to do them while compiling or on the target itself. An important thing is to provide an OpenGL configuration file. It's important even if you do not want to use OpenGL um, because otherwise the build uh, is guaranteed not to run well. You'll have a lot of errors uh, complaining about uh, OpenGL and you really need to disable that. So here I actually specified the egl.config file, as you can see. And let's have a look at this. So egl.config, it just says 00 Android. So I don't want to get in trouble. I'm not going to deal with DRM of virtual machines. It's always problematic. I just disable anything, and that's it. Uh, the Android OpenGL ES system knows to parse this file and knows to what to do with it. OK. So we were at the board config itself. BZ image is obviously a kernel. So uh, this is something I compiled last year, May 29. Today is April 29. OK. So um, this is a BZ image. You can see it's a Linux kernel x86 boot image. It's a version 3.4.5. It was good enough for me then. It will be good enough for me now, too. But I will also show you how I boot a vanilla image later. So obviously, there's nothing there. I promised to touch ALC, ALSP, KVM, MK at the end. And, and now I have a couple of interesting stuff. So first of all, um, I have here an external directory. In the external directory, I have a couple of make files. I wanted to show here how I actually attach new components to the, my build system. So I have the Android MK file, which says call all sub your make files. So it will include all uh, make files under this directory. And I have a couple of projects here. One of them is the Android terminal, which is a terminal emulator for Android. Obviously, it has an Android MK file, and it has some stuff. I didn't write a single line of code over there. I just forked it. OK? And there is my amazing state-of-the-art Hello World application, which uh, I wrote all the line of it myself, I swear. So basically, it also has an Android.mk file. And it says the following. It says local path, include clear vars. So if I have some garbage from before, I want to be on the safe side. I don't want to risk in having uh, the same variables and then confusing the build system. And then it has local module equals a low C example. That's the name of the module. And it's optional, so I don't have to include it. And a low.c is uh, the only source file I will need. Local shared library, liblog, because I want to use the Android logger on it. I want to link it against the logger. And include build executable. So when I build it, actually, I will have an executable running this. This is not an Android package, right? It's not an APK. It's a C application. And um, one thing about the optional, actually, if you have optional here, it means that if you, if you want to build this project, you will have to specify it. And I'm saying it now explicitly, because when I'm, when I'm going to talk about the packages I'm including, you're going to see 
the hello C example module, okay? So this is how it looks, and just uh, for the sake of completion, a load C includes SDDIO, it includes Android log, and this is the tag, printf's hello native Android world, and it uses Android log print, uh, info, log tag, hello native Android world. So this was under external, and this external directory will be included, okay? There are some system property files that I can override, and there is something called vendor setup.sh, which actually adds the files to the launch. When I do launch whatever, then I need to provide it the name in order for it to show on the launch menu. If I know the names myself, I don't really need to add them to the launch menu. The build system will work anyway. So here I will add ELC 2014 AOSP KVM and the variants ENG for engineering build, user debug for user build with some debug features, and user for production builds. Okay, now what I have here left are the init files. So I will talk about the init files, and then at the end of it, I will talk about uh, the package files, and then we'll be able to actually run the software. So what we have in the init files, first of all, we have the init.aosp.kvmrc. This is how an Android init uh, file looks like. So it has some on something, do something. For example, on init, init is an event on the system, uh, make dear storage SD card, and s do some sim linking. I also did here um, class start exam two, uh, which is a service that I added. I can do some stuff. For example, the most uh, service, the most important service in the world, there is a limitation on the, on the length you can give services. Then I'm going to run system bin hello C example, which is the executable I built before. It's going to be on class main one shot, but the Android init mechanism is for another uh, class. So this is something that is going to be called init.aospkvm.rc because my device name, and I'm going to give it in the kernel, uh, in the kernel command line, I'm going to give android.boot hardware equals aospkvm. This way init.rc, just, just a moment, this way init.rc will know to read the aospkvmrc. Yeah, question. If you want to add external devices or external, okay, that's a great question. I'm going to attack it now. So basically, uh, there is something in the Android system. Uh, by the way, this is the last session of the day, so I'd be more than happy to answer questions even for two or three hours after this session. But uh, about the volume, de about uh, SD cards and. Uh, removable or, or non-removable media, there is something called so uh, core so um, there is something called actually it's not here there is something called Voldi entire system Voldi and if you go here, you will see that there is actually a language for processing mounts, and it's all written in C, and this is actually one of the simplest, uh, it's not that simple if you're not used to it, but this is actually one of the simplest components in uh, Android. So if you just want, if you look at the source code, you'll be able to figure out uh, the syntax. But what I'm going to do here on my init is actually have um, an fstab file, just like as I would have in Linux, okay? So the fstab file would look as follows. It does a lot of commented out stuff from the emulator because uh, just for the sake of, uh, of uh, education. And it has the following thing. I give it uh, the device block I want to use. In this case, it's dev block sdd. I give it the designated mount point. I give it the file system, it's vfat, and just because I wanted to do it, because I attached an artist to QEMU, I said it's non-removable. I don't have to make it non-removable, and if I want to manage removable uh, software, I do it on the fstab file. This fstab file would actually be read 
by the KVM RC and it's happening here init.aosp KVM RC mount all mount all is a, is a directive that takes a file and it gives to the vault D which I said uh, look, you can look at the source of it earlier it gives to the vault D um, all the parameters lines of the files one, uh, one, one after the other and it knows where to mount how to mount, what are the characteristics, and so on. And we need to specify the partitions of the removal device. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So what I did, I actually attached a disk uh, device. And I'm going to show it uh, a little bit later when we run it. And uh, I'm attaching hard drives to the QEMU emulator. And, and I attached the removable SD card, which I made non-removable. I attached it as the fourth hard drive. The other partitions would be for the system, the data, and the cache. But I'm going to get to it uh, in a couple of seconds. I'll, I'll elaborate later. OK. OK. So um, this was the initRC and, um, and the FS tab, which is important. I can also have, a, I can also call in shell script, Linux shell scripts, if I want to. For example, if I have one guy who is expert in the Android init syntax, and I have one guy who is proficient in Linux stuff, then I can do some uh, initialization in the Linux land um, within the shell script. So in this uh, example, the only thing I did is I set console-g in order to tell the Android that uh, this is a graphical console. Because otherwise, uh, a lot of times you'd get some flickering of the text console on your graphic uh, display. So another thing I have here is all scripts, which just uh, copies some stuff. And there's nothing interesting there. I'll show you later what we have. And I have an overlay folder. The overlay folder is very important because you can put the file, like framework base core res res values. And whatever is here, some XMLs or resources or PNGs, will actually replace the contents of whatever you have on the Android build system itself without you having to deal with source control. I mean, otherwise, you don't want to pollute the build system itself, so you do an overlay. This is a very common uh, concept in uh, embedded system. So this one actually adds Ethernet, but um, you can add a lot of other stuff as well. You can customize a lot of things in Android this way. But um, OK. So the last thing, I also put here, there is a tablet, look at it, and the GitHub, a template for adding applications. So if you want to add pre-built APKs, You'll put it in the app here, and vi android.mk actually says that, hey, whatever has the suffix of apps, then uh, just, and it's built, pre-built, then just uh, put it on the system uh, image eventually, under a system app. Now we're almost close to finishing this um, customization, and we'll do it as follows. So this is the last file. This is one of the most important files. It is the AOSP KVM MK file, which I said will be uh, left for the end. So what I do here is call in here product, product language is full.mk. Call in here product, product full.mk. So actually, source target there is build, OK? So the build directory, there is build product, and then it has some make files, like I showed earlier in the, in the document when I went very quickly on it. Then you have. Device package overlay, which includes the device overlay. If I want to, add, to overlay some XML files, I can do it there. Product packages will say which packages are being included. Product copy files will say what files goes from my host into where in the target. Product name will be ELC 2014 AOSP KVM. The device is AOSP KVM. Product model is AOSP KVM built for ELC 2013. That's a bug. It's 2014. Uh, build display ID, it won't be shown here. It will be shown in some other stuff. And build ID will be shown in the about phone and it will be LC apps, uh, whatever. Product packages. I wanted to add to it OpenSSH, SCP, FTP, some keygens. And then I added Android term, which was under the external, and LOC example. If you remember, then I actually. Uh, called the, I called the file, I said local module LOC example, okay? So that's 
the exact same thing I see here. Low C example, local module name, that's exactly what you need to put in order to add it to the product packages. Now, product copy files do the following. It takes the source files, okay, from my host before the column, and it copies it to whatever lies after the column. So the rules are as follows. If it says root after the column, that it's going to be copied into the RAM disk. Otherwise, it's going to be copied into the designated folder, to the specific folders. For example, aospkvm.rc, which is the init files, naturally goes into the RAM disk. This sh script that just set the console, I decided to put it in the system. I could also put it in the RAM disk, and I could also not use it. Now, I have a file called kvm.sh, which I'm going to use as a helper to run it. And I'm copying it to kvm.sh. It's not copied anywhere, so it will just be copied to the folder where all my uh, output uh, files will reside. I have a busy image kernel, which I showed you earlier. I'm going to copy it to the output directory and call it kernel. The fstab.aospkvm, which included the mount point you asked about, is going to be copied into the RAM disk, fstab.aospkvm. Basically, everything that happens within the init process has to be in the RAM disk. It's very important. I have some pro pro that property overrides. I can actually uh, decide the heap size, and I can decide a lot of other things. And there is another override which is not really relevant. So this is what I have here. Now, I want to have a look at the host scripts. So I have a couple of host scripts which are, I actually don't have the vanilla kernel tap KVM on the script. I only copied KV, kvm.sh, but these are the same uh, principles. So if I look at kvm.sh, I'll see the following. At first, if I don't have a cache.image file, I create it. So I just dd0, I, it's going to be a 200 megabyte file. Its name is going to be cache image. It's going to be filled out with zeros because it's disk dump or dev zero. And then I'm going to create an ext4 file system out of it. So that's what I'm going to do with that. Make a fast.ext4 cache image, and that's it. Then I'm going to run the KVM. So this uh, techniques, it will work also with uh, Zen and with VMware and with whatever. But you have to do your own modifications for the virtual machines. So in this example, I'm going to run KVM. And I'm going to do the following stuff. Dash HDA, first hard disk, which is going to be under dev block uh, SDA. I'm going to attach it to the system image file. Second hard disk, the data, user data image. Third hard drive, cache image, and I already discussed the fourth hard drive, which would be the SD card. The kernel would be kernel, which was before that VZ image. The initial RAM disk will be RAM image, which actually the Android build system also creates automatically. And then I'm going to append a couple of um, parameters to the kernel command line. So I'm going to say QEMU equals one to get rid of uh, some hardware acceleration issues. I redirect the console, I don't have to do that. Android boot.hardware equals AOSPKVM. This is critical because init.rc includes init.aospkvm.rc. Uh, I can do it and I can skip the check JNI. I'm giving it the VGA mode. Uh, it's VGA equals 794. I don't remember the resolution. But it should be some sort of tablet resolution. And I'm also attaching it serial device because I'm a Linux guy, so I'm used to it. And now. Yeah, definitely. You can do log level equals 8 or whatever. Yeah, definitely. You can and you. At, at first time, you, you should. Um, so basically, here, this net user, net nick, you can also use a tap device, which would be the much preferred way to handle uh, any emulation with QEMU. But configuring tap devices uh, is a bit tricky, and you need to have root privilege. Um, and different QEMU behave differently on different operating systems. So. It's just easier to use the user. I'm going to give it a 2048, and TTY saying just uh, cleans a little bit of the serial. So this is actually what I'm going to do in order to run the emulator. And once I've built, and uh, just a recap, I would do, for, uh, I would go to the root directory, I do build, uh, and set up, launch, uh, if I just do launch, then I have uh, the name of the targets here. 
which added with vendor setup.sh. So I can just choose uh, ELC 2013. Then I would hit make. Of course, I'm not going to do that because we're running out of time. Unless you want to wait for a couple of hours more, I'll leave you my laptop. <laughs> OK? And uh, at the end of the procedure, I'll have all, all my build artifact under out, target, product, uh, AOSP KVM. So let's see what we have here. So I have a KVM.sh because I copied it uh, with the product copy files. I have a root directory, I have symbols directory, I have system, object, and so on and so forth. These are intermediate directories. And then I have run disk image, which will have the contents of the root uh, folder. I can show it to you later, I can prove it. I have system image, which will have the contents of the system folder. Um, I have user data image that initially contains some stuff from the data folder, but once I run it, it gets overridden, and then the, the data folder doesn't get overridden. And I have cache image, which I created with uh, this DD and uh, makefs.txt4. So um, now I want to run it. So if I do kvm.sh, this is the serial console. And this is Android. So you saw it was wow, this. It's with control D. So if you saw, then it was pretty fast, like uh, putting it up. I should have a terminal emulator. Search is stopped. Not my fault. But um, okay. So basically, I have my terminal emulator here. And I also add like the, my hello. This is too small. You can't see anything. Uh, so I'll, I'll connect a, a tap device later, and I'll do it with my second example. But the important thing is that if I look, if this moved, okay. If I look at the settings and about phone and so on and so forth, then I can look that um, the build number here is ELC two fourteen, blah 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 blah. My build name. And um, Android version is 4.4. .4. And now it's E. Usually it would be a K or A, uh, probably because uh, the name of the device is ELC. And uh, the kernel version is 3.4.5. .4 I use the pre-built kernel. And uh, that's pretty much my device. Now. The resolution looks a lot higher than ETA. Yeah, it's uh, not 788. I think I put it 764. Um, there are some codes for the VGA resolutions um, that you can provide when the VG, with the VGA uh, parameter. So this is one example. Uh, another example would be if I use a tap KVM SH device, and then I'd be able also to, I created a tap device. I gave my device a predefined IP. Um, and then I'll be able to connect to it if I wanted to. So I could do like ADB. ADB connect. This is the API I gave it. OK, so it's connected. And if I do ADB shell, then I'll see that proc version is my kernel, is a latitude to D6420. It's my old computer. And I can see that, uh, for example, what's can interest me. Like the CPU info, cat proc CPU info. Oh, of course, proc CPU info. Then I can see here that it's a QEMU virtual CPU. I gave it for processor and so on and so forth. So one last thing. Um, so this is pretty much a device that I have. I can actually navigate it and uh, ADB shell. You know what? I can even do ADB lock at and do less. So the first thing I see in the look at is the low native Android world, which is what I written to the log in my amazing and low Android uh, example. So this is a full-fledged Android device, right? So uh, that's pretty nice. Another thing I can do now is actually run something with the vanilla kernel.
and you'll see now the penguins. You saw that? So this is something I compiled from the vanilla kernel. By I can show you the configs, um, but we will soon run out of time. Basically, I just uh, enable staging area, enable everything in Android. Um, this one is a, lower a bit lower resolution, but it's still fine. There's a problem with the mouse here. So there is a problem with the mouse here, so never mind, but uh, I can show you if I connect to this device. If I connect to this device, I could show you that, uh, let's see. Okay. So if I connect to this device, I can see that actually the kernel version here is uh, 3.12.6, okay? So it's a vanilla kernel, um, and that's pretty, that's pretty nice. I mean, I, I, I pretty much used the same thing. I just replaced the kernel, and when I wanted to build the kernel, I'll show you my kernel directory. So um, I think I used the 3.12.6. So if I have a look at my config, then I'll see that I have staging area. Config staging equals yes. I have a couple of Android uh, parameters like config Android equals Y, Android binder IPC, logger, timed output, low memory killer, intef alarm dev. I should have a couple of virtio uh, parameters, virtio block, virtio net, and obviously config virtio should be here somewhere, yeah. And I have a couple of uh, Visa and FB stuff. So this is the kernel configuration I made, and this is a vanilla kernel. I mean, I, I didn't do anything. There is, it's like, I, I'm not sure how, how, uh, how familiar most of you are with kernel development, but you know, it's just trial and error, and it's just, you know, just uh, take the guidelines I said about the configs, and if it doesn't work, then uh, try a, a brother of the family. And it will work like for this kind of devices, especially for the QEMU. So I actually showed you a fully fledged um, tree, which pretty much shows you it, you, it can get you started with uh, the build of an uh, Android device, custom device for x86, both with an Android based kernel or with an Android Goldfish emulator or with a vanilla based emulator. So um, that, that's pretty much it as per uh, the device customizations. And I want to conclude with a couple of uh, guidelines about um, the build for this and so forth. So when you do, basically we, we went over the build folder and about the device folder, and we talked about how to add a new device and uh, you can find it on GitHub or Nubo. But when you actually want to deal with QEMU, you need to be aware of the following challenges. You need to adjust the kernel to work with your QEMU version, you need to know what QEMU parameters you run because when you have a hardware emulator like a QEMU, then it has a lot of options. And if you, for example, choose one NAT device and you do not enable it in the kernel, then it will not have network. So you need to adjust the devices. Um, graphics, you should probably refrain from using hardware acceleration and the uh, SD card, you should uh, do the trickery, decide how to mount it, where to mount it. And in KitKat, it's extremely important because almost nothing works without an SD card. The browser will cease to work if you don't uh, specify an SD card. So um, that's pretty much uh, it about it. So one more thing I'd like to tell you is that uh, you should be, when you want to work on a real device and not on an emulator, then you should really be worried about uh, be worried about the blobs, about uh, binary blobs. It is always a problem with every hardware, and uh, if you make a real device, you need to know your hardware. But uh, what I showed you right here should get you started, at least with building uh, fast prototypes or building fast emulators or build, or build uh, the prototypes for any x86-based device using a vanilla kernel, and um, you can just reproduce the very same steps just as is. Just a couple of um, source. If you want to start hacking the code, then you probably want to go to source.android.com 
the Android Tech 36org project, um, which always happy to receive volunteers, is in android-x86.org. The Android IA product is hosted at Intel at 01.org slash Android IA. And the device tree is on github.com slash Pronubo. Um, you're more than welcome to contact me for any question. And um, thank you.